I'm going to jump into uh, the discussion on inflation, and uh, it's one that won't go away. Uh, so I think it's probably appropriate to uh, revisit it uh, again and, and look at where we are and where we think we're going. So uh, right now, there's a lot of concern. Are we going back to the 70s? And, and uh, what kind of inflation do we have? We know we've been at historically low levels in the U.S. and central banks have been trying to push the inflation levels up from the uh, you know below sub two percent uh, range, and uh, so where do we go from here? And I think the uh, last Fed minutes came out when they came out listed uh, bottlenecks and shortages were mentioned uh, nine times, and tapering was mentioned eight. So. Clearly, the inflationary aspects of what's going on in the economy are weighing heavily into the discussions. I don't recall bottlenecks and shortages being mentioned that many times in the past. So Edward Denny had an interesting piece from two days ago where he went back and said, well, let's look at what happened in the 70s to see are we going back there? And I think there are some characteristics that are very unique. Um, first, President Nixon closed the gold window in 71, which led to gold prices going up. Uh, almost 1,400%. The dollar declined versus the Deutschmark and commodity indexes rose by 153% over the decade. So that's one element of it. You then had supply shocks, which caused soybean prices to rise uh, considerably in late 72, early 73. You then had the oil crises of 73 and 79, which had uh, WTI. Uh, increased by 870% during the decade and cost of living adjustments, which were clauses in the labor union contracts to have uh, wages go up regardless of what was going on in the economy and the business, led to a wage price spiral in, in a number of areas. So I don't think we're in the same uh, boat right now and uh, for a lot of different reasons. One for the US, you know, uh, I know, I saw it yesterday, or this morning that the Permian, uh, uh, production for October is on pace to be only 100,000 less than it was pre-COVID. So it's going to do 4.8 million barrels a day versus 4.9 pre-COVID. So uh, that's the one area of the country where you have significantly low production costs, where they can produce an increased production right now. You could argue that the um, uh, up in the Dakotas, they could do it too, but their rigs are a little less mature. So I think it's a different scenario. So let's look at why it might be transitory or why it might be more persistent than transitory. And I think when you start, you have to start with monetary stimulus, which I'll show you in a second how that looks. I think the one thing that's really creating a lot of concern is the massive proposal of the reconciliation bill. And I'm actually curious because I think it's safe to say that people believe the infrastructure spend on physical infrastructure and the digital infrastructure needs to go through and a, a trillion dollars is something we can't afford to not do. I think there's arguments for a lot of what's in the reconciliation on the human infrastructure that can go through, but I think there's a math problem in getting it all done at once. So I think you have to triage this the way you would in a company or the way you would in your household finances and do first things first that are the most important. I think the well-documented supply chains not easing is a, another element that's leading to this uh, more view that it might be more persistent, as well as the commodity prices, rent and housing. And I'll go into that a little bit more from a study from the Dallas Fed. Obviously, we have wage pressures growing and you're starting to see more strikes being uh, planned or threatened um, from a lot of the unions as this is their time in their view to get back some of the lost wages. I think they have to be careful about a Pyrrhic victory and that they get higher uh, hourly wages, but robotics substitute a lot of capital for labor and they don't serve their union overall as well as they need to. I think the labor market skills mismatches weighs heavily and we are having stronger than I think people were anticipating global growth right now. And that's somewhat confounding uh, people. But just looking alone at the balance sheets of the Fed and the ECB, I think this is fascinating. This is just a five-year look back. We already had a big pop from the 0809 period. And then you look at how steep the and how swiftly the U.S. reacted uh, in the green bar, uh, green line going up. And that is actually, I think, what's 
given the economy uh, the wherewithal to uh, move past this, and then you add to it the fiscal stimulus. But I, I think there may be an argument that the tapering is coming either too late or at a particularly good time. I still don't think rates are going to rise. Another element of why there's higher inflation and concerns about it from the wages is this is uh, very hard hit areas of uh, the economy. The light green is leisure and hospitality, and this is the quit rate. So these are people who are either can't deal with their jobs anymore or feel they can find another opportunity more quickly, uh, particularly as government benefits are subsiding. But the blue line is the total quits, and that's uh, had a pretty significant and sharp move up. We haven't seen a move like that for some time. And if you look back to 08, uh, you can see how little people were thinking about quitting back then um, in these same areas. So we have this little reversal. How long it lasts, we'll have to see. Uh, but we also have historically high job openings with the jolts showing uh, over 11 million jobs. So a big mismatch there that uh, will work itself out and I think will end up in lower prices. The Dallas Fed released a, a, a paper the other day on the 14th of this month where they really looked at inflation and the factors impacting it. And the study is actually uh, pretty interesting, but they looked at the pandemic related services and how uh, where they were pre-pandemic and where they are now. So if 100 is the uh, pre-pandemic level, you can see we had the uh, downturn going into uh, the start of the pandemic in Q1 of last year, continued through actually till the beginning of this year when the vaccination started to take hold in a material way. And then you start to see this moving up. So this category is hotels and motels, it's public transportation, it's membership clubs, sporting uh, events, uh, parks, theaters, and museums. And you're starting to see that come back. And I, I saw the CEO of Delta on the other day where he said business travel is now back through September at 40% of where it was pre-COVID, but it was only 20% uh, the previous quarter. He thought it was going to be higher at that point. It didn't quite come in because of the reasons we know, but this is a look at it. And what you're starting to see is a leveling off of the reopening trades for the hardest hit areas. And that could mean that we will see uh, inflation stabilize some okay. as we move forward. Motor vehicles is another area that had big sorry, price sorry. issues. I'm sorry, is there a question? No, okay. The motor vehicle area, there's three big areas that have really pushed prices up. Um, uh, autos, uh, airfares, and hotels. So let's just, we just looked at a couple of the others, you saw them rise. Now just looking at the auto sector. And the Dallas Fed projected that auto prices would decline in one of two scenarios in their, in their model. Uh, the first is uh, uh, their baseline is that we give back 5% five, uh, uh, 5%. I'm sorry, 25% of the, of the increase that occurred. So basically it's up 34% they're giving back or 30%, they're gonna give back like um, 25 of that. Um, that's the baseline for it. So that they think prices are gonna come down from the increase about 5%. But if you go to at the end of 22, if you look at where their base, their low growth scenario is, if we can clear the semiconductor shortages faster, you could be back to pre-pandemic levels by uh, the end of this year, end of next year in autos, which would be a big uh, move for the, for the uh, relieving some of the pressures. Housing is the one area that looks more persistent from the Dallas Fed report. And what they're showing here is where the actual was and then the baseline. So the baseline for them would be a return to the 3.3% rate uh, that we experienced in 17 and 19, an increase in housing services. So this encompasses uh, houses and it does a conversion for rents to what the rental equi equivalent would be. And so that's one scenario, that's their baseline. However, if we still have problems getting back to uh, where, where we were pre-pandemic, then you, they're looking at a potential 7% increase in housing prices, one of the more stubborn areas uh, in, their, in their research. So overall, they step back and they look at this and they say, okay, core PCE in August was 3.6. They think we could be looking at something more along the lines of um, 2.8 uh, going forward with a low of 2.2 uh, if we get back to um, where we were pre-pandemic in uh, housing and autos. So um, 
pretty interesting scenarios there. That gives you a sense of why inflation might be more persistent or transitory. We're still in the transitory camp, but it's going to take a little bit longer. And the reason for that is we expect tapering to start, which is going to reduce the monetary stimulus, but we don't think rates are going to rise. As we mentioned from uh, before, global short rates are rising in the emerging markets with uh, their central banks doing 45 rate raises already. Um, that just shows you the unevenness of the global economy. You could see port congestion start to ease as ports are now running 24 seven and corporations are really investing very heavily to ease the pressures. And now you're starting to see unions uh, participate. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there are some deals being done to uh, start the negotiations on uh, wage contracts with the unions to help ease the problem in the near term. But the other element of it is corporations are investing extremely hard in robotics, digital process automation, and other advanced technologies, which will reduce the overall wage bill for companies uh, while the wage rate could still be rising. And the other element that's at play is this massive shift of uh, supply chains out of China to other local manufacturers, and what does that mean for us? So uh, I mentioned the JOLTS report before. We have a lot of job openings. They're starting to, you can start to see them be filled. Um, I know in our firm, we posted uh, for two jobs, and in a weekend for each job, got over 300 resumes of uh, fairly qualified applicants. I would have to say we're surprised by how fast the response was and how quick it was, but there are openings. And what's interesting is the manufacturing sector is seeing a lot of openings and they're starting to fill some of those. Um, so this is a reflection of where the opportunity is for onshoring and reshoring. So our base case is, you know, these transformations are real. They're going to be with us for a while, but you have so much liquidity that um, you're going to see markets move up, consumers continuing to uh, by and uh, we think that the supply and demand dynamics are the hardest part of this assessment right now. I think the Fed will, will begin tapering. We think it's a good idea. Um, they were late, I think, in the first in the 08 09 when they started to taper. Um, and then it was a surprise. I don't think it'll be a surprise this time. They were quite clear in, in their descriptions of it. So that's not coming. But we don't think they're going to raise rates meaningfully anytime soon. And even if they start tapering, you're taking it down from 120 at $15 billion increments a month. So you're going to be adding money into the system until next year while rates remain low. That's going to allow time for consumers, corporations, and governments to continue their spending and to uh, improve productivity, which leads to a very positive outlook for corporate earnings and profits, but really for the companies that are uh, in, an, in a, an area where there's price il inelasticity for their uh, uh, products, which you're starting to see more of. And I think if, for those who weren't on early, uh, Greg was mentioning that you're starting to see a lot of negativity out of the emerging economies. And I think what you're starting to see is um, these divergences between the haves and have nots on on a country level, a company level, and on a household level. And that's going to continue as long as we have these policies that are in place to promote asset values, which is an offshoot of promoting, stimulating the economy. Um, we still think equity investing is the best game in town. There are some interesting opportunities in private credit uh, because of the banks stepping away from it. Um, we still think China is a difficult place to invest in the near term, but we don't think that's permanent. I think people have to get used to the new policies. And, you know, they took a pretty radical uh, approach to addressing their economic challenges inside of China. And uh, the world's going to be uh, at some risk for that. I think one of the countries most at risk, depending on how it plays out, is going to be Germany and which way they go, because they are, uh, I think, China is their largest trading partner now. And uh, that's going to play out. So inflation will run hotter and longer than we anticipated, um, but productivity increases we think are going to be significant. And we also are in the camp that the secular deflationary forces are here to stay, whether it's tech, demographics, or debt, um, they all weigh heavily on the system. So I think those are a lot of the issues that are at play here. So with that, I'll stop and open it up for uh, debate and discussion or views from others. So. Stephen, um, quick question. Um, this is Luke Tempe. Um, the 
the um, I think there's a, a lot of talk right now about the just in time supply chain model, how it's not really adequate and going to cause a lot of major backup um, because of what's happening in the changes within the markets and, and just uh, economies. And I think uh, the European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde also warned that uh, the globalization uh, era is pretty much over and um, Europe needs to take uh, drastic steps to uh, uh, stave off um, systemic shocks to their supply chain. I think the I think you're right on the supply chains need to be made more resilient. I'm not so sure that globalization is dead. Um, I think it's going to be different. It'll be in a different character, but global economic activity is really high and has moved up. If you go back in time, you know I, I saw a study that um, I think we went from uh, global consumption of 30 trillion to uh, like eighty trillion dollars, and that is that means the whole world's really starting to consume more. Living standards have come up, global GDPs have come up. I don't think you put the genie back in the bottle because of what's occurred with the trade wars and the, and the pandemic. I think what you will see is different a reorientation of supply chains, and I think the real area is going to be who has the commodities that are going to be essential for everything we need. And there's a lot of press today on magnesium being one of the, the big bugaboos and China's the leading producer of magnesium. Um, but that's, that's in somewhat of a deficit right now. And that has a big impact for aluminum, which means the auto uh, sales are going to be impacted too. So I think what you're going to see is people finding substitutions for products that are either in hard to get areas or in areas that they don't have a good political relationship with. And I think that's what uh, the pandemic has shown you have to figure out how to avoid being beholden to any one nation for your supplies. Uh, and I think that's going to go on, but I don't think globalization slows in this process. Uh, and once you reopen from the pandemic, and you're already starting to see with the travel figures, as you get reopening and people can start moving again, I think economic activity will even be further augmented. Other thoughts on that area or other areas? Hey, Stephen okay. Duncan, I, um, I, I'm sort of a little anecdote here. I remember dating myself, walking into the trading room, you know, like 1983 or something and listening to all the people that had been there for 10 or 15 years talking about how much inflation there were, there was, and bond yields were, you know, double digits and the CPI and the PPI would come out every week and it would be three tenths, four tenths, you know, and I and I'm you know I'm new to this and I'm looking listening to them and I'm looking at these numbers print and I'm like these people are nuts. You just gotta, you know. So it's kind of interesting. So you come in and uh, you know I was selling bonds. It's like okay, every time it was just obvious to me buy the bonds, right? So <laughs> that's the comment. And and I'm sort of wondering. I almost feel like are we in the opposite scenario here, right? I mean, I believe the story that this sort of inflation was uh, transitory a few months ago, but I'm not sure I'm, I buy it anymore. I, I think they've found a way to, to, they've essentially, through government policy, they've essentially allowed 50% of the workers who were probably underpaid to essentially all go on strike. And they're now insisting I got to get paid more. And they actually have a very good hand to play given, you know, the administration and, you know, I think the way a lot of people feel it isn't quite right. So there's that piece. And then the other piece is, as you say, there's this permanent amount of sort of structural onshoring that needs to be done so that you can't always buy the lowest cost product because you have to be a little more strategic about how you can manage the security of that. And to me, those two things, you know, these could be in place for a long time. And so I don't know what inflation rate that gives us, but I just wonder, you know, you know, the risk to the markets and the pricing is this low interest rate thing, right? I mean, that's why you can trade growth stocks at some, you know, big number, right? They could be great companies and they could uh, be, they could be worth much less just based on discounting the cash flows, even if the 10 year note just went to three and a half or 4%. And if I just walked in and saw the 10 year note of three and a half or 4% and the inflation numbers were printing, I'd say, that seems pretty sensible. You know, I mean, 
So anyway, I just, I just throw that out there. I'm just curious how people feel about that whole thing and how transitory people really believe it is. And when do we one day look at the 10-year note yield and look at the inflation rate we've lived with for three or four years and say, these things don't make sense? It's a great question. And everyone will have a different opinion. So thoughts from the, from the crowd? Richard? Yeah, Stephen, I'm happy to um, tackle that. Um, you know, U.S. inflation has remained higher and broader than expected. There's no doubt about it. Um, headline U.S. consumer prices were up about 0.4% on a monthly basis in September. Um, and more than 70% of the categories in CPL were up year over year versus, you know, 7% showing a decrease. But if we exclude food and energy, the average month over month CPI price slowed from about 0.8 in the second quarter to about 0.2 in the third. Uh, which is a faster deceleration than the headline rate. Um, you know, what, what do we do? Investors need to, again, look for winners from global growth, global growth perspectives. Uh, we think that the Fed policy will remain accommodative. But to, you know, to everyone's point is, um, you know, with inflationary pressures remaining transient, we do think that the Fed will accelerate monetary tightening. So investors should continue to look for kind of unconventional sources of yield. Um, that's, you know, a lot of our clients are, are worried about that in that perspective. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just that kind of, I think, um, interesting to know, you know, we don't expect a sharp rise in energy prices to impact growth or inflation. You know, oil intensity of as a percentage of GDP declined by about 25% since 1990 and by more than 50% since the early 1970s. So, you know, we don't think the oil price shock is here to stay. So, you know, if you take away energy and food, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's why we're telling our clients, you know, that it is transitory. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, I think the debate about transitory and persistent is, is actually an interesting one because it's not defined in terms of time. Yeah. It's just two sure. words, transitory and persistent. Um, as, as is the uh, flexible average inflation targeting, right? So we, we don't know where, where they, they actually come and really try to stop it. Right. Right. But the, but I think the, the point is that if we're so it, it's hard to frame what is transitory. But after you get through a lot of the anomalies in the economy that we have right now, and we we acknowledge that there are some highly unusual uh, machinations in the market that um, you still have the fundamental issues of demographics. Russia was down the last report on Russia. I think they had a population decline of 997,000 people on, what is it, 145 million population. Japan continues to have population declines. China has it. Anessa was talking earlier about you know the, the Korean government really trying to promote um, higher birth rates so that we get uh, more in. And I think you know you can want all that stuff. But I think the reality is that we have significant structural headwinds for inflation that are being distorted in the near term by the uh, supply chain issues and other issues. But demographics, debt, and, uh, and technological advances are here to stay. And I do think, as I mentioned earlier, that globalization is going to be hard to put the genie back in the bottle. It'll be changes in supply chains, but not the same. But Happy to hear other people's views on that as well, or other topics they want to cover. I, I have to, if I could just jump in, but uh, I think my main concern is energy because what I'm not clear about, I mean, I find very encouraging what you were saying about the Permian, uh, but uh, for a large part, the, a lot of the supply just can't be turned back on so quickly. I mean, the mothballed coal plants and whatever, and China is seeing a lot of power shortages right now. And um, so, I mean, one aspect, of course, with coal coming back in, everything is the pollution aspect of it. But uh, even ignoring that, it's uh, just, uh, I mean, it's the turning a super tanker quickly uh, thing, which just doesn't work. It's, so that's my main concern with the skyrocketing natural gas prices in Europe and so on. It feeds through and uh, supply disruptions in many metals right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great point. And, uh, but the, the issue is that uh, everyone expects once you're in it, that you're going to stay in it, right? You're going to have these things. But China already, I think, announced today that they're starting to reverse their uh, uh, coal policy, which I don't think is much of a reversal, to be honest with you. I think they're actually ramping that up again. So I think you're going to see China's uh, energy issues start to ease pretty quickly because central planning can 
ease it a little faster. I think yeah. Europe has a real issue with energy right now. Um, I think they tried to, the train left the station a little too early on the green initiative before you had the transitional foundation in place. And I think we're going to deal with that for a little bit of time, um, particularly as we're heading into winter. Uh, but um, I think that a lot of those issues will resolve themselves. We could be stuck with higher prices for longer. Um, and that's one of the elements of, of transitions like that. When you have to invest heavily and cut off what you were doing existing, you're going to have higher prices for a period of time before it, it works. I think the real question is, are the alternative sources uh, as reliable and dependable and uh, valid as everyone would like them to be to get the green transition going. But I think energy is, is a, you know, you can't ignore it. Um, but, you know, we're still at, you know, relatively low gasoline prices in the U.S. relative to where we were in 07, 08. Um, they're moving up that way. But I think the spike in natural gas in Europe is going to be an issue for Europe, and for sure. And, and the fact that they're dependent on Russia very heavily for their supplies and a lot of, <laughs> This is an environment for bad actors to act badly, um, and they're doing it. So, so I I have to jump in. Energy is near and dear to my heart. Um, we're in twelve uh, oil and gas production units, so I tend to in the Utica, so I tend to follow it fairly closely. With regard to coal in China, one of the issues for them is cutting off purchases from Australia. Um, for political reasons, right? Um, and a lot of relatively cheap, easy to access supply that they just said, nope, we're not going to purchase it. And they didn't have really good alternatives. Um, as far as natural gas, we went through a few years of extremely low prices. Um, in the Utica, the main production is gas and natural gas liquids. Oil is more of a byproduct. In the Permian, it's the reverse. And so you had lots of natural gas being flared off. It was waste product. Um, pipeline capacity for exports to Europe, uh, the limitation is the liquid uh, natural gas liquefaction plants. Um, you know, in, in Europe, I'm I'm in the camp uh, that Russia is playing a game because of the Nord 2 permitting process. Um, it's an artificial constraint as far as supplies to Europe. So that's my two cents on that. Interesting take. I, I did see that. Um, I, I actually, we heard from one of the companies we were talking to that they believe that Australia and China are actually trading in, in uh, uh, a lot of the things that they say they're not trading in right now, uh, as I think both economies need the trade. Um, but for public uh, distribution, they're uh, boycotting each other. I, I'm not sure which is the right answer, but it was an interesting take that uh, everything's not always what it seems. Oh, absolutely. I'd love to share just a little bit of Please. info, Stephen, if I may. Please. Yeah, so Janan George here. Um, our patent forecast data, as we're looking at the robotics sectors, we are seeing like a continued increase in filing. So the investment US and globally in robotics, particularly in collaborative robots that relate to applications for assembly, manufacturing, healthcare, um, and even service work. We're seeing increases, Walmart being in our in the top five, you know, in the last two years in particular. So it's it, initially we saw much of that investment coming out of Japan and um, Southeast Asia, but we've been seeing more and more investment from US companies in the robotics area. So I'm in agreement with that commentary to increase productivity and efficiency. Yeah, I think it's also gonna be a, a pretty significant issue during uh, labor negotiations where uh, you're going to have to decide how many robots are going to replace workers and and how they're going to do flows and things like that. It's going to be a pretty interesting thing, but I, I actually think people are underestimating what you're highlighting is how fast that transition is taking place. And I think you're going to see a geometric acceleration in 
in the uh, applications of agreed uh, we've even seen some early stage companies that are funded that are deploying them almost as their biggest competitors to staffing agencies so uh customizing or adapting for particular companies to replace the staffing issue yeah uh rob welcome from the west coast i i saw your post last night with uh who are the two who you're with a billionaire and a famous athlete i'm blanking uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a European family office friend I've known from Africa about a dozen years ago, and and then uh, Vladimir, uh, former uh, uh, heavyweight world boxing champion, him and his brother. So uh, yeah, I, I, just to get a you know, question, you're talking about energy in, in big oil and, and all that. Um, the um, activism, um, you know, there's a lot said about you know, Exxon and the activist strategy, this small hedge fund took, but then later got to, you know, critical mass. Um, do you, do you have some thoughts on, I think Chevron's been talked about, about, you know, defensive strategies and other, are there these uh, legacy entities, what are they doing to, you know, uh, to defend both the ESG side, but also some of this is corporate finance and, and activism and um, and preparation for that. Well, it's interesting. I think on the climate side, I think they're doing a lot, but not getting any credit for it because they're going to be fundamental to the energy transition. So you you can't transition without them on the fossil fuel side. So I think the I think the intent of what Engine One did was right. I think the whole view that you you wish a transition to happen as opposed to plan a transition to happen and affect the change over an appropriate period of time without creating these shortages like we have would have been a nicer approach. Um, so I'm not sure that just, you know, forcing people's hand is going to get you what you want without a lot of inflation. Uh, on the other hand, I do think there are a lot of programs being done by companies like BP, Royal Dutch, and Chevron to make energy more efficient and greener. But you're not going to get credit for it because you're producing fossil fuels in the near term. I think over a longer term, I think they're going to be fundamental to transition. So be careful how we handle them would be my advice to the world because you need them for the transition. The one that's doing the most is Shell out of Amsterdam. They're doing, Shell and Total are doing the most green active work from the, the work that we've done. And, and you know, Anthony, just what areas are they focusing on? In, in doing just, that. For a long time, they've been, um, you know, converting uh, fuels to greener fuels. They, they're involved with plastics um, in terms of converting waste plastic back to, to energy. And they were doing it uh, from, from what I understand and what I've seen before this became a, a mania and an urgency uh, as a result of disinvestment by certain investors such as happened to Exxon and so on. It was so, beyond green, greenwashing. But yeah, so it, don't think it, 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 it doesn't look to me that the companies are bad. Anthony, can you finish and then we'll- Sorry, yeah, yeah, um, I, I was interested, Stephen, in trying to understand your umbrella view in the sense that if you look at COVID as being a form of a war and what's happened historically in the past, post the um, First and Second World War and how that impacts, um, um, you know, central banks or whatever the equivalent was at the time um, and, and what, we're, what we're in for now. Um, and then that with the idea that many participants in credit markets have not seen uh, including many of us on this call, have not seen this kind of, um, you know, buying such as the, 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 the central banks and all the Fed are doing. And it's not just domestically in the US, but it's globally. And so trying to think forward and trying to anticipate, you know, how that ends when many companies are uh, existing because of rates that are not, cannot be persistent or perpetual or, or never ending. And when those rates refi to higher rates, how does that trickle down? And then lastly, um, I'm, I'm just throwing different ideas that perhaps you could tie together. You know, we like to think of things as 
pockets. You know, we know that Russia has an excess demand of gas in their line into Europe. And then we, we somehow decoupled, pun intended, that with what's happening regionally, Permian Basin and our own um, resources. But the difference now is potentially that you can't decouple it because all these countries uh, ultimately are linked to the dollar. And when they're in stress, it comes back to roost uh, on our central bank. And that potentially is a, you know, a lurking risk, again, tied back into inflation that can have uh, catastrophic uh, events if, in fact, one can't produce through productivity, through growth, through innovation, through technology, one's way out of it. So I was just curious to see how you, if you have an opinion about that and if you could help me synthesize that. I do have an opinion. For those that are going to be hurt by rising rates, we're going to have a lot of there's going to be a lot of bankruptcies from a corporate corporate perspective, and there are going to be a lot of countries that are going to have some real issues because they just don't have the tools to compete in this economy. Um, so I think you're going to see, again, this haves and have nots that I was describing earlier just get exacerbated by what's going on. I do think a lot of companies have been carried by the low interest rates so that the bill's going to come due and they're not going to be able to survive. Um, mainly because they're choked off from making the investments they need to make to transition their company to effectively deal in a new economy. Um, the other thing that'll come out of that is a lot of M&A activity where they'll start hiving off uh, lower growth businesses and to sell them off into other areas to get the cash to make investments back into what do they think could be growth businesses later on. Um, I think because of that scenario, uh, what it could mean for countries and companies um, that's going to force central banks to keep rates low for a longer period than they would like. Um, I think the U.S. may move earlier than uh, they would, but they won't move materially. And, you know, we're talking about a huge difference from moving up to 3% versus what we're looking at in the 70s of moving up to, you know, 18% in inflation rates. So I, I don't, I, I think governments are going to have a real challenge ahead uh, without question, but I think there's going to be, it's going to force the productivity uh, changes that have to go on in companies at a much faster rate, which is going to keep their wage bill down um, while wage rates can rise. And I think that's an offset. Um, the other thing, and this goes to a, a comment Duncan made earlier, is that, you know, this wage inflation is not all bad. It actually is healthy because we had this big inequality and the wage inflation will tend to root, move higher uh, on the uh, lower income people because the wealthier people have their money and in, in most of their income or most of their money is in assets. So um, I think you're looking at it as not necessarily as negative as everyone thinks it is that these higher wages are going to come in. They'll, they will be permanent, but that's not always a bad thing because it gives consumers more spending and all that. If the companies can keep their wage bill down, it'll be healthy. If they can't, then they're going to be not competitive. I think those are the differences. So, I, Anthony, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, better. thank you. I think that was a good syn a synthesis. Good. Duncan, I promised I'd come back to you. So Yeah, listen, I first, I, 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 Anthony, I apologize for interrupting you. I just, I get very excited about this topic. And um, I, I find it fascinating, as you say, that Shell has been pursuing, you know, these sort of more ESG friendly strategies for actually quite a long time now. And as far as I can tell, the energy companies, traditional fossil fuel companies that have tried to do that, it's not obvious to me that they, those guys or Total, for instance, have gotten any credit from the point of view of the valuation of their company or you know, some of the, the, um, the uh, large endowments and sovereign wealth funds that have pursued these disinvestment policies. And, you know, I, I also, you know, I'll cite a little example here. I listened to Jim Cramer last week and he does this little program where he um, lists, he, he calls up, you know, you know, Joe Sixpack and, and says, okay, let's see if your portfolio is diversified enough. So these guys will get on the phone and they'll talk about their five or six biggest holdings. And Kramer will then comment on whether they're diversified enough to the market. He interviewed six of these people, not one of them had an energy holding. And Jim Kramer, you know, he didn't ever criticize anybody's portfolio for not having a holding. And by the way, 
my biggest annual expense on utility type things is probably my collective energy bill. So I put these things together and I just feel like there's a dysfunction in the pricing mechanism in the market. First of all, if people feel like they shouldn't be invested in the energy market and they're clearly uninvested. Secondly, if the large corporates that are actually trying to do the right thing aren't getting any uh, valuation benefit from doing so. Um, so, I mean, I'm sort of throwing this out there, but I think it's a worthy debate to have if we're gonna be thoughtful about this energy transition. Why is it that people that are trying to do it aren't getting credit for it? And, you know, what should we do as participants in the market, uh, you know, to sort of be a winner here, both on the ESG side, the energy transition, but also get a return in your portfolio? Can I, can I say something, Stephen? Please, Greg. Because that, that was one of the things I mentioned that, that I was very surprised at the, at the IMF meetings was it was the first time that there's pushback on ESG. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the definition was we're going through the first global energy crisis of the ESG era, right? Um, I think the answer to Duncan's question is, as investors, can't be evangelical about it. Um, and you can't take the position uh, on the extreme left of the, of, of the spectrum of it, and you can't take the position on the extreme right. I think we all agree that something needs to be done, but you can't switch the fossil fuel uh, switch off the way some people thought we could. Um, question the uh, reason why the fossil fuel companies are not getting any type of, of valuation uh, bang for, for the work that they do. And it may end up that they may actually be some of the better contributors to, to the change eventually is because the, you know, the world needs an enemy. <laughs> and so you get these, <clears throat> you get these, uh, these investor reactions of divesting your portfolio of, of anything that, that looks like fossil fuels. Um, and, and, and that's what happens. Um, the JP Morgan oil analyst, uh, uh, spoke to basically was said he was having a conversation with uh, the chairman of VP and and the chairman of VP saying you know, we don't need to do this I mean there is so much oil in the world we can we can figure this out and the analyst responded yeah but you're not going to find investors going to give you money for it because you're BP um, and so that's I think uh, I think what needs to be what needs to be solved you have to take a middle ground approach to to this transition. Otherwise, it's going to be very messy. It's going to be very costly. I, I do think the other element of why they're not getting credit is uh, too many times in the past, they've talked about showing better discipline around their spending patterns and all that. With When prices moved up, they overspent. When they came back down, they underspent. And I think people are waiting to see if the financial discipline that they these energy, particularly the oil companies have showed in the last uh, uh, five years, is actually going to stick, and are they going to, with the higher prices, start ramping up production right away? And is that going to create, um, you know, more of the problems that were going against them? I just think that if they show the financial discipline that they haven't shown in the past, they'll start to see more valuations realize as well. So I think Duncan, that is an element of uh, the past is what people have been relying on for a lot of the way they approach these companies. You know, Greg, this is Rob. Just one quick point there. Um, you make some, some some interesting comments. I think on the other side of it, though, some of the change that's affected and the pace that's been affected, um, I don't think you're going to see as much done on an accelerated basis. I think the Exxon transaction was a, a bit unique, um, and uh, more folks are going to be thinking through having defenses to that. So I think to those looking for pops in activist funds, because I've even seen them present at infrastructure type things. And um, infrastructure is long duration type returns and versus, you know, sort of an activism play. There's going to be a disconnect. So I think the, the point on the investor, I, I think BP and these large entities, they have, they're going to have, they're still going to get capital from different areas. There's deep relationships. And I think the point there is that the timing and um, um, the management of, of timing and return and governance changes and other things like that, um, I, I think there's going to be some either correction or some realization that things aren't going to happen that fast. I think the other interesting thing on that, Rob, is that there, 
they do have a financing mechanism in place that they that they're already using right now, which is trading assets uh, that they have that are lower producing access for uh, to others that either because of the continuous nature of the of the field, uh, others can produce at a lower rate, or uh, they wanted to get into that area to build a toehold in. There is still a lot of M&A activity going on, and I think that's going to redefine some of these companies as well. And it wouldn't surprise me if uh, part of this transition for these uh, big fossil fuel guys is that they start buying more assets in the uh, non-fossil fuel area, in the alternatives area, and that's going to make it even harder for people to make their assessment of ESG on these guys because they're going to be on both sides of the trade. So I think that's going to be a, an interesting issue to see how that plays out. Other topics people want to cover? We have a couple more minutes and uh, some good discussions and good ideas from around the room. No. But I'd like to take a minute and thank everyone for coming on these calls every week while well, Mark's not on. Uh, he's very promotive of me and I appreciate it, but uh, I really appreciate you guys continuing to come back and participate in these and listen because uh, uh, it's, it's appreciated on this end. So thank you guys and uh, uh, thank this community because I think we're both benefited from it uh, immensely. So kudos to Mark, even though he's not here. Uh, so Thank you. Thank you very much for joining and thanks for all the participation, guys. And we'll uh, talk next week. All right. Thanks to you. Take Steve, care. Also. Bye bye. Thanks.